Hello, everybody, and welcome to Coffee Class with Young Screenwriters. We are an online resource and community for up and coming screenwriters. And today, we are going to be breaking down an amazing film, one of our films that we feature in writing, feature in writing the feature, actually, Arrival. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm super excited. This is one of my favorite movies. Adam is going to break it down for us. It was originally. Hey. Oh, I oh, thought Alexi hey. and Abishai. I was originally. Abishai but... brought his own sign. Wow. Who knew? Is that taken from the movie? Oh. Uh... <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. See, it's all. It all I mean, makes. John, sense. I thought you were going to project ink. <laughs> oh, my aura. Man. My round aura. <laughs> Yeah, but this is, uh, yeah, the great Adam. You have the tent pole. Yes, the... I do. I do. I'm gonna go through it super okay. fast. So we can get. Bobby, this I mean, uh, Alexi, yeah. I thought you were breaking this film, not to put you on the spot too much. I hmm. was going to, and then I my eye was hurting a lot, and I decided oh, I don't want to okay. have my face blown up. I'm trying to stay as far away, far back, so you can't tell. My eye. Can't tell. Oh well, now yeah. I'm, I'm looking for it. By the way, I even, know. we we wouldn't be able to tell it hurts no matter what because it's not. Well, like... it was a little in fact. It was kind of gross. It was like red and like it wasn't cute. And so I was like, I really don't want my face to be blown up. You know. Mm. So we decided we focus. Yeah. I, I'll, next time I'll just wear sunglasses and no one will say anything. I know ex that that's exactly what would happen if I wore sunglasses here is that no one would say I anything know. i don't know and I everyone think, would just I, let I, it go first thing i would say <laughs> there's something different about a, you what is it this is gonna be a real <laughs> reach and and you can and adam will call me out on it if it's too too great a reach but this just happened to me earlier today i asked a friend of mine if she knew so and so in an email mm -hmm. and she mailed back yes wear sunglasses at night And I thought, what a great, that's all you need to say. It's a great character description. It's like, now I got it. You don't like her. It's like, no, no? Is, that, you didn't, is that too far? Is that too far to go? Speaking of sunglasses, no. remind me, because I just love it. She just wrote back, and she's a very funny woman. She said, yes, know her. Wear sunglasses at night. Oh. No? Is that it's true, or working. is that just like her judgment? But that song, uh, uh, is it, was that a reference to the Corey Hart song? It is a song. Dun, 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 dun. You know the one? I don't know. Yeah. Oh, are you going to sing it? Oh, Adam's going to sing it. Sing it. Yeah, no, take no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> Wait, there's a, there's I, I don't a know the lyrics. There's a, there's a song about what? What? It's called Sunglasses at Night. It's like an 80s pop song. It's uh, One Hit Wonder. It's great. You guys should look it up. Okay. Um, we, we've run with the sunglass thing, haven't we? <laughs> let's, let's talk about Arrival. Let's talk about Arrival. Uh, <laughs> no please, please. People There's came here to like, talk about the movie. Um, I, I'm just going to do my breakdown. Alexi, Alexi okay. requested I do a breakdown, so let's do it. And then I want to hear what Avi uh, has to say. So, um, Wait, you don't want to hear what I have to say? No, you yeah, know, I, I, I hear I hear you, you <laughs> speak every enough. day, every uh, week, uh, John. <laughs> You're tired of it. I get it. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm tired of me, too. So anybody's different. Um, okay. So Arrival is a fantastic science fiction film. It opens on Louise Banks, a linguist, and her having this really intimate moment with uh, a gir little girl who we presume to be her daughter. Uh, they're playing. They're holding hands. There's an ominous sort of tone to it, but it's like what really comes across is extreme intimacy. And, you know, moment, we get a sense of who this person is as a mother and her relationship to this little girl. And at the end of this little sequence, she says this great line, says, I'm not, now I'm not sure I believe in beginning or beginnings or endings. And she mentions that uh, I thought I was so sure that this was your beginning. Um, and I think she says the name of her daughter, but I don't remember. Um, and we enter on her and her everyday life as a professor, a linguist professor at some university. We don't really get into the specifics of where, um, I assume in California somewhere. Um, and she, as she's sort of going to her day-to-day -day job, uh, and she's sort of lecturing to this group of like 12 kids who don't really seem very interested, uh, they're saying, could you turn on the news? And boom, not even five minutes into the movie, we get 
aliens or these giant monolithic shapes have descended on Earth, 12 of them, one in each of the um, 12 nations, 12 monoliths. And in they're all sort of arrive in random places uh, that don't seem to have any correlation. Uh, the one in America arrives in Montana, one arrives in Greenland, all over the place. And obviously the world freaks out. And we sort of have this sort of sequence where she's sort of watching the news, grappling. We see the world uh, dealing with this information and speculating um, until Colonel Weber arrives in her office when she comes. She's the only one who arrives in uh, to her, the lecture hall early on in the morning. She comes to her office. Colonel Weber comes and he asks her straight up. This is about, you know, the big aliens that showed up. Um, <laughs> and he asks her if she can translate the language. He plays for her a little recording um, that seems almost incomprehensible. And he asks her, can you translate based on this? And she says, uh, no, I'd have to be there. And he says, yeah, right. I'm not going to let you, uh, you know, be there because if you come, everybody would, you know, would want to come and see the aliens. Um, obviously the tone's a lot more dire than that language I'm using, but, um, basically he sort of says, okay, you had your shot. If I leave here, you're not getting it. And she asks him, are you going to ask my, the, this other professor from Berkeley? For the job and he's like yeah i'm going to him next uh clearly he's her competitor or something and she tells uh colonel weber to ask him what the sanskrit word for war is and its translation and he sort of looks at her like okay and nods and it's very clear that you know she's waiting to see how uh the interview with her competitor goes um competitor rival we don't see this person so we don't really know what their relationship is but Colonel Weber arrives um, helicopter <laughs> at her house, and it's very clear that that interview didn't go well. He he shows up, and she asks him what he answered, or what what she asks her what her answer to the question would be. And I believe I, I believe it would be uh, the need to get more cows or something, um, but not uh, maybe an obvious translation. I was kind of a moment that went very fast. I didn't fast that I didn't really pick up on, but he liked the answer apparently, and he invites her to go with him to find out what these aliens are up to in Montana. This is a very efficient act one. I, I sort of see this as sort of the breach into the new world, um, 15 minutes into the movie and she's on her way to Montana. And her objective is very, very specific and clear. We know from the moment he asks her <laughs> uh, to decipher the the translation, it's crack this, le the alien's language. Um, there are a lot of motivations for this, the secu national security crisis, um, her own intellectual curiosity. Um, a lot is riding on this. Uh, clearly, the clear external stakes, these giant monoliths are coming. They could blow us up. This could be an Independence Day kind of thing, and maybe he should have hired Jeff Goldblum. Who knows? Um, sorry, a little joke there. Um, and as she arrives in Montana, you see this makeshift military base the ominous monolith in the distance, the tone is so fantastic. Uh, clouds sort of, you know, sweeping landscape. It looks so alien and unknowable. We meet uh, sort of the cat friends and enemies of this military camp and um, the Montana base. Uh, aside from Colonel Weber, who's a friend, we meet Ian, who's a scientist. Oh, well, she meets him on the helicopter ride there. But, um, and we meet sort of the shitty Agent Halpert, Halpern, sorry, not Halpern, uh, I sort of peg him as the antagonist. Alexi has a slightly different read, um, but um, he's either way, he's an enemy in that he's definitely a philosophical, philosophically opposed to um, Louise. And as she arrives at the base, she, she immediately starts prepping for her first visit to the aliens. They, there's this awesome sequence where, uh, you know, well, after they ask her and screen her for questions like, uh, you know, are you pregnant? She says, no. Um, is everyone able to process experience like this? Um, the aliens can control the airflow in a space. They don't really understand what that means until they arrive in the conveyor belt up into the edge of the monolith. And there's this amazing moment where they sort of leap up and gravity sort of shifts and they're able to walk up the walls, scaling into uh, the monolith. It's really cool. Um, but basically, after this alien, very alien experience of boarding the monolith, we reach this sort of viewing area where the there's mist on one side and these creatures on the other and they have cameras set up they have recording devices amy goes up sees the aliens for the first time um and 
it doesn't seem to go very well. Uh, but we cut back to the camp and the military base asks her, okay, what's your plan now? What do you got to do? You got to figure this out. Stakes are real. Well, I have to explain why we aren't making progress. We're competing with all these other nations to find answers as soon as possible. Um, and she's sort of it's like, okay, we're going to try visual communication. Next try, um, next day, I assume a few hours later, uh, she goes back in and she tries getting a whiteboard, writing human on it, uh, brings up her name and sort of like, um, you know, when that happens, the alien responds and an inkjet comes out of, um, and she spells sort of the circle and it's a huge breakthrough. Everybody's excited. Um, but back on the base, again, more obstacles. The, the colonel is like, okay, but how do I sell this? Like, what is, like, why are you focusing on such basic, you know, human inkjet? Like, we, why are you focusing on the basic, uh, you know, set of words and definitions? Why can't we ask the question, what is your purpose on earth? So basically military pressure, they want to get to the answer. She's saying, wait, no, I need more time. I need to establish a basic, uh, you know, basic uh, common shared language. Um, and she invents this kangaroo story about, uh, I don't won't get into that. I forget the details, but she basically tells a story about like linguas, uh, about language and, um, on the potential dangers of misunderstandings. Um, but basically the English, the alien language is so unlike anything they've seen before. They spend a, the next time she goes in because she, the bulky sort of hazmat suits they're wearing are sort of impeding what she thinks is sort of the connection with the alien. She takes off her suit and she goes in and basically really close to the glass and she has sort of another breakthrough. Um, Ian also takes off his mask and they sort of have this moment where they the alien sees them and sort of identifies their name and they name, <laughs> they name the two aliens, Abbott and Costello. Um, which I really love. And throughout this, we sort of see more flashes, more memories of the daughters, uh, sorry, of uh, her daughter. Um, and it's sort of intercut in a way it feels like memories. Um, and we don't necessarily understand why at this point um, she's there, the filmmakers are making this choice. But um, basically they have a huge breakthrough where they realize the la that the, um, that the uh, language of the creatures, the written language is uh, non-linear, orthography and it's basically not there's no correlation between a spoken language and the language it's all just written sort of like kanji i think um but um it's also sort of non-linear in the sense of like there's no beginning or men end to their like syntax um i'm butchering that by the way but that's the basic gist from what i understood and basically um she also sort of starts like having conversations with Ian, sort of like, well, you know, have you started dreaming <laughs> about this language and thinking about it? Is the language you speak determines how you think, which is a really important idea that comes back. Um, and we find out that the on the national scale, the Chinese are using a game of shogi, or I think it's shogi, but they're using a game uh, to com communicate with their aliens. And Luis basically sort of says, oh, that's that's not good because in a game, there's an implicit uh, bias of someone has to win and lose. And that will affect the basic presupposition of what the conversations are going to be about. Um, and so you we get a sense that though that conversation with the Chinese is not going as well, um, or at least it from her point of view. And basically, she's forced at this point to ask the aliens um, to what uh, to, to force the question of what is your purpose here? And their response is offer weapon. And this freaks out, and this sort of happens concurrently with all the other sites. And this basically freaks out um, the entire uh, world leadership and, you know, Russia and China are going to, you know, uh, you know maybe take a more aggressive military uh, a position against the creatures and you know Luis is frustrated but she's like no 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 a weapon could mean other things it could mean tool it could mean like it depends on like the under of uh, our shared if they understand what a tool is or like we don't know more than we know to make that assumption and basically um it gets to the point where she sort of has another breakthrough where she where her and Ian go in, um, they're not allowed to, but we see the sort of beeping C4 that one of these rogue soldiers sort of plants and she starts to um, write directly on the glass in their language and they explode into thousands of little circles um, and uh, the C4 also explodes and they, they fall and it's a very chaotic moment. 
Um, but this is sort of the midpoint of the film as I have identified it. And because it, you know, it accelerates the stakes and it changes the status quo and makes the objective far more difficult. Um, and it creates a new, new world. And in this new, new world, uh, the aliens are, are much higher in the air. They retreated. Uh, one of the aliens is wounded and tensions have ri risen to the point where all communication between scientists uh, across from all the nations have been cut off, uh, China initiating the broken communication. And basically, everybody's expecting that there's going to be a military retaliation. And basically, there. this is a great point where they intercut the memories of where Luis's daughter asks her, is there a language for uh, something like a compromise, but not quite? And basically, she comes up with the, uh, the not a win-win situation, but a non-zero-sum game. Um, that applies to their situation. And she realizes... Uh, well, they all realize that the twelve na that the aliens want the twelve nations to come together. Um, it seems impossible in this moment. And at this ultimate test, Luis goes to the ship alone, discovers Abbott's dying, and she has this huge breakthrough where she discovers that her memories from her daughter are actually premonitions, and that the aliens' weapon that they want the humanity to use is actually the language. And when they finally made that giant spurt with all the thousands of little circles, that was the um, sort of the basis for the entire language um, that they were sharing. And they've been trying to share the language. The basic, uh, you know, explanation was in 3000 years, they will, we will need humanity. And, you know, this is a gift. So you can do that in the future for us. Uh, the non zero sum game where both parties uh, get something out of it. Um, we, and we the sort of, we transition into act three where there's an all is lost moment, even though Luis has this knowledge, um, the camp is evacuated and countries are prepared to fight the aliens. Abbott appears to be dead of the alien. Um, uh, they can't uh, seem to get another chance of convincing people to listen to, you know, Luis, Luis is out basically. It's like, this is a military time. The Colonel says, we can't sort of deal with this anymore. And she sees her daughter and the, another great moment where the daughter asks why the dad doesn't look at her the same way. And he, she tells him, I told him something he wasn't ready to hear, um, which is a great sort of representation of what her inner need in the story is, which is, um, I'll get into the little bit in the end, but it's basically the, 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 the acceptance of the journey, the acceptance of the, the future, even if you know it's going to be terrible, even if you know your daughter's going to die horribly, to still enjoy and still make that choice anyway because it's what you have to do. And sort of, she sees the future, the gift of the language, and basically she's, there's this great sequence where she sees a vision of the future while the camp is sort of dispersing. She sees General Shang, the guy in China, the Chinese leader who's uh, initiating the shutdown communication and the military move against the aliens. She sees him at like this sort of gala uh, thanking her for something she said to him uh, 18 months earlier and that he gives her his private number and tells her the last words his wife told her to tell him to tell her back in the past and it's this great moment it's all intercut with uh, great music and um, feel and memories of her daughter and we sort of have this final fight sequence where she grabs a phone and she runs off to a part of the base um, agent Halpern's phone the real shithead who's kind of was interjecting with his pessimism the whole time and she's cornered at gunpoint where she's trying to make this phone call which is catastrophic failure she calls General Shang tells him uh, the thing his dead wife told her uh, sorry his dead wife told him, um, or not dead, but the, his dying wife. Um, and basically, General Shang won't attack the aliens because of this phone call. And all the nations come together to share knowledge. And it's this great little, um, little moment um, of using the language to see the future and collaborate, which is, in the end, sort of what the aliens sort of meant by, like, the 12 coming together as one. Um, Humanity is pooling its resources and coming together because of their gift, the language. Um, and Luis decides that she'll stay with Ian, even though she knows that they'll have a daughter together who will die. And he will leave her because this is the nature of the gift the aliens gave to them. It's the, and despite knowing the journey and where it leads, I embrace it and welcome every moment of it. It's sort of that sort of understanding. At the beginning, she has this sort of intellectual curiosity to understand and to prove herself, to know the answer. But really, it's about understanding the journey 
even even if it's painful, making that same decision anyway. Anyway, that was my read of the movie. Oh. Good job. Great job. Great job. Great movie. Great movie. Really what do you guys good. think? Yeah. I you nailed it. I mean, I, you know, you nailed it. It's, and I and I it's a, I I love the movie. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. One of my favorite yeah. movies it's, ever. It's a it's a wonderful movie. And it, 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 it it's also just kind of proof of you want to get into create a story with these heady concepts that's willing to go into these sort of complicated alleys of linguistics and the nature of time and and all of that you have to do it in a way where ultimately it matters on a human level where it's less just sort of intellectual here's an interesting idea and more about here's how it is important and consequential in a way that will actually affect your own personal worldview and i think that it does that just so wonderfully so have you all got a chance to read the original short story no, I no I, I, it's funny it. I, i'm sorry what <laughs> I've, re I've read about it i have seen, i, I, I know what about. the differences are and the reasons why the, those choices were made i want to share this with you because i think it's so so this is just the short story and there's not a particular part i want to share but like reading it you're like holy crap you know, like it's it, it the vibe of the the feeling of the adaptation is so dead on, even though they did change some things. It's really cool. And I wanted to show it's basically like intercutting between her memories and of the daughter and what's happening, like what the movie is. But I wanted to show how it's written because it's really cool. Um it opens with this with this paragraph here. Your father is about to ask me the question. This is the most important moment in our lives and I want to pay attention, note every detail. Your father and I have just come back from an evening out, a dinner and a show, it's after midnight. We came out onto the patio to look at the full moon. Then I told your dad I wanted to dance. So he humors me and now we're slow dancing, a pair of 30 somethings swaying back and forth in the moonlight like kids. I don't feel the night chill at all. And then your dad says, do you want to make a baby? Um, and Beyond, then it eventually moves into the alien thing, but it's constantly cutting back to these really cool moments where, it, let me, um, oh, and also has the can kangaroo anecdote, which is fun. That's a great, that's a great story. So here, let me find, sorry, I'm almost, I want to show how the intercutting is handled. This. Like, I remember a conversation we'll have when you're in your junior year of high school. It'll be a Sunday morning and I'll be scrambling some eggs while you're setting the table for brunch. You'll laugh as you tell me about the party you went to last night. So this like really interesting way of playing with time, like saying, I remember a conversation we will have. Yeah. You will be doing this. And like, I remember mm -hmm. it. And it's like, when you're reading the short story for the first time, you're like, wait, what is going on? But then it like, it does this really cool thing that the film captures perfectly where these memories start happening closer and closer. And like those connections, like the zero sum game, the non zero sum game and all that stuff starts interweaving faster and faster. And if you haven't had a chance to read the short story, I would highly recommend it. It is in the, um, if you have got a chance to check it out, I would definitely recommend reading it. It's in the link of this video, the description of this video, um, the full one. But anyway, just wanted to share that. It's a really yeah. cool. I remember. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you know, just philosophically, the um, what the movie is saying uh, is really interesting. There's a, there's a point at which I think it's right around page fifty six. Uh, when they have really their heartbeat moment when they're sitting out, the two of them, and uh, um, uh, we we need, I think the line is, uh, we need to be able to talk to each other, uh, which is thematically the entire film. Uh, it's just, it's so smart. It's so well done. Um, I did have one thing. I want to know what, what you guys thought. Um, you know, a lot of times... When, when we review, when, when we look at these films or or I'm hearing students scripts um, obviously I'm looking for what's what's gonna be problematic what's gonna and for this film um, I 
expect to get I expect to get a knee jerk reaction. But for this film, so little happens because your protagonist is really just going into this pod and and talking or trying to talk, trying to talk. So so her actual behavioral action is very small and it's going to be now what they do is they build it so there's a lot of suspense a couple of people have mentioned the soundtrack which is yes the soundtrack's wonderful um uh the going into that environment is fantastic uh there's a lot of suspense the 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 the, the beans on the other side of the glass are are terrifying and curious and all that but there's not much for Amy Adams to do, except for to keep going back to that glass and trying to get language. So it's, I think it works well. I think it works well. Well, but John, I would, the one push up that I could put on is that, isn't that what a linguist would do? It right? is. Like, and and right. by the way, it's exactly why you don't <laughs> see a lot of movies about linguists. I mean, isn't yeah. it kind of wonderful that there is a mid budget but like about like $40 million yeah, sci-fi sci yeah, movie like 60, about yeah. linguistics. Yeah. And, and not only did it connect, but it connected to such a degree that it was an international hit. It was nominated for like eight Oscars. Like it's yeah. really quite the thing. But I, I, I would say that while there's not so much overt physical action, she makes choices, right? Like there's that great mm. scene where she has to explain, here's my strategy for working with them. And then she has to convince the people who are letting her do this to let her follow her strategy, which takes work on her part. She has to convince them. That's the verb to convince. And there is that sequence where she's not getting through to the heptapods. And so she makes the choice to take off her suit, right? The hazmat yeah. suit, yeah. which is throwing herself at risk. Like every, like whenever they want to make sure that we are engaged in what's going on. It's not just an action, it's a choice. And that that's what strikes me about it, that we care about the choices being made versus just what is actually with her hands, you know, being done. And I, I was just listening to an interview with um, Eric Heiser, the writer, and he was talking about how, by definition, this is a very exposition heavy story, right? Yeah. There's a lot of explanation that has to happen. So the way he does it is he always frames it in an argument where if two people disagree, and each of them has to explain why their view on the subject is correct. We're getting the explanation, but it's through conflict and it's through choices. And then every scene that ends like that is a victory or a defeat. So that's what story Adam... is happening, which is wonderful. Like it, it's 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 what keeps it out of the purely intellectual realm and makes it emotional. That's what Adam calls attacking with exposition. Um... You know, that you can like sneak in this exposition if you attack the protagonist with it, if you create conflict. Otherwise, it's just like, here's this, right. and I'm going to walk you through the instruction manual on what's happening. Attack's position. Yeah. Um, it's, but I mean, I, it's tons I, of exposition, and it's, and again, that would go back to I love the film. I think it absolutely works. But again, in, in, in the development stage of this film, my gut reaction would be is, taking off that suit is not a terribly active thing for a protagonist to do. Right. But well, that's, it is that's in, the part of why... in the context on the, in the context, right? Like it's physically endanger endangering. Like it's a strong choice to make, like with consequences, like there's consequences just... politically, right? Well, what, what struck me, yeah. about, oh, that, yeah. what struck me about that moment though, what struck me about that moment though is the it's danger pretty... there wasn't that she was going to die. Like she saw the canary was alive and, that you know that she was safe, and we know she's safe. But the danger that she faced is the danger that she faces through the entire movie from start to finish, which is the very impatient, untrustworthy people employing her will pull the plug, right? So they are saying, "Oh, should we abort? Should we abort?" As she's doing this, as Ian's doing this, and there's always that threat of like even the first time she goes to visit the heptapods, the big risk there is when she gets out of the ship, she says, "Am I fired?" Because she thought that she didn't handle it well. So it's always that big threat of, will I be yanked off before I get to finish? And that's why I think the suspense works. It's not the suspense about, will she survive? It's the suspense of, will she finish? And there's always so many obstacles to her finishing. There are people who think that the aliens should be killed. There are people who say, you're not moving fast enough. There are people who say, you know, we, 
you know, like we cannot communicate with the people we're working with. So the conflict is always high and it's always dynamic. Uh, and here's an interesting thing that I heard in an interview with, with, um, with Heiser. There were more sequences that were just purely teaching the aliens words. And when it came time to create the movie, the producers and the director said, why do we have so many scenes where we're explaining all these really basic words? And Eric, Eric Heiser was like, well, it's important. You, this is how you do it. And they're like, yeah, but this is like, it's boring. Explain to me why. And so he put up a whiteboard and said, well, the question is, why are you here on earth? You know, like, why did you come here? And then he explains how you have to break down each and every individual word and all that. And then when he finished that, they said, well, that's the scene. And so he removed oh, all go. of those teaching scenes go. and just like, well, now it's not your teaching. Now it's, you are convincing the people who are going to cut the plug why what you're doing needs to take time. And suddenly and you're saying- there's conflict like, in that. There's, yeah, and there's then it, conflict ends, on a threat. it right. ends on a threat because the colonel then says, okay, but stick to your approved list of words. Yeah. You know, it's you know all, there's always that sort of Damocles. I do see what John said. This was- because Adam and I both broke this separately. Um, this was one of the films that I was break that I broke in writing the feature, and then Adam broke it now. Um, and it was, I see what John's saying though, because it was really hard to break. It's like what, what is her flaw, and like what is her objective, and like what it, like what are all these like the literal pieces I found were really difficult for me to put into place, and like who is the specific antagonist. The flaw in <coughs> stuff was the most difficult part for me. Adam, you look like you disagree, maybe. Oh, I I think that this is a, a situation heavy movie. You know, yeah. um, the objective was super clear. Like the objective was clear and we had a strong sense of personal conflict at the moment. I just to clarify think? with Brian, uh, his comment here is that, yeah, she was being shown images from the future. What I said in the breakdown was that we think their memories when we first see them, we just discover that they were glimpses of the future towards the end. But like those glimpses are sort of showing us um, sort of emotional vulnerability. We just don't, it's not necessarily articulated in a clear flaw yet until act three really, which is kind of maybe the issue that conventionally is difficult to break down. Um, because right now you have it. You wrote down obsessed with finding answers. Like that's her motivation to do the job, right? Like as a linguist. Right. Right. Yeah. This I is your breakdown too, problem. right? You agreed. Yeah. With yeah. That, I, I. I didn't answer. Okay. I, I put. I agreed with it. I. I just. Um, for me, it was. It like really, it was about. Um, it's soft. It is soft. But that line at the end, despite knowing uh, the journey and where it leads, I embrace it and welcome every moment of it. That's clearly her inner need. And that's where yeah, she ends right. up. Yeah, we know yeah, exactly where she ends up. <laughs> and that's philosophically the, the film, right? Yeah. 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 Right. This also yeah. is, is interesting that, and I, I wonder how many how many of our, you know, our group here, um, what I what I find most frequently for myself and with, with screenwriters is that a story something sparks your imagination and you say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna explore the story. And you begin to design it and develop it and, and do the beach and then you write it. And somewhere, I generally speak, somewhere in the execution of the draft, of the first draft, you may find out why you were inspired to tell this story. It, this film feels to me like they knew before starting it thematically what the story points are. Um, and, and it's one of the mysteries of, of, of storytelling screenwriting is that writers are drawn to subject matter. We, we don't always know why. And then somewhere during the process, we go, oh my God, that's why the story, that's why I, was, I felt the pull to this. But this feels to me like they knew thematically what they wanted to say and then went into the story. Uh, did, does that ring true for you guys in terms of your, your approach and when you find themes? Yeah. Yes. Well, in, in my, in, I, think in my... this, I think that this one might be a little, like I really think everyone should check out the short story because the short story has such a similar vibe of kind of like just like setting up this is what it is and this is what I learned, not necessarily like, 
like there's something non-traditional about the way that the story is set up in the short story that carries over to the film in that it's not necessarily like it does feel like it was a theme first sort of a a movie which isn't uh -huh. very which isn't super common except for like in like really like preachy movies that don't work and for some reason this one works and it's like why how i don't know how but it I, does I, and i really I think, like it i think what the reason it works is that it's uh, untrodden territory you know people don't really think about language and the unknowable and sort of this sort of speaks to the idea that human beings are deeply uncomfortable with the idea of a future version of ourselves that's better you know or more uh, understand this this sort of teases out like a, a, a catalytic moment where we change fundamentally into something better and something different, something alien. And like, there's the whole crossing of the threshold of like communicating with life on other, like this is a first contact movie that's really nails that unknowable, you know, nebulous spark. Yeah. spark. It's great. So there's a lot you can go into that. There aren't that many stories about this, you know. Mm -hmm. There's that great uh, and, Jodie Foster movie, right? Uh, first contact. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Yeah, also, this is, um, uh, in, I don't know if you'd call it an adaptation or inspired by, maybe it's both, but 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 that also may be why the theme was there prior to the writing of the script. Um, Duel has got a question here. Is it mandatory to know thematically what you're going to say? No, no. And again, I mean, that's, that's why... Um, it's why I, I, I can't think of a better word for it, but that's one of the mysteries of the pull of creati creativity. That's one of the mysteries of, oh my God, this idea came to me. Writers will say, mm -hmm. came out of nowhere. Well, the fact is it did not come out of nowhere. It came somewhere out of some subconscious somewhere. It didn't come out of nowhere. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's somewhere rooted in you and you find that as I keep, as I'm saying here, uh, uh, in the writing, in Can the I, process. So I kind of, John, mm. I might disagree. Oh, good. <laughs> Are we gonna, I, I think I, we're going to have conflict. Is this conflict? Are we going to now explain our, both of our opinions on this and a conflict? Yeah, I think is yeah, absolutely. Please. So, you know, I think you might not need to know what you're going to say when you first start outlining, but before you give that script to somebody else, you need to know what it's saying. You know, like it has to, it has to happen at some point. Like We're you need. Relaxing. Yeah. Well, yeah. But I think that like, so you save yourself. Um, it's like the same thing as like, why you outline first, like figuring it out first will save you rewrites. So like technically you don't need to outline before you write your script, but then you're gonna do 27 drafts. Technically you don't need to know your theme before you start writing, but then it's gonna take you more process to find it and to like pull it out or else you're gonna have something that's not like of a piece. Like you're not gonna have the feeling that it's of a piece unless you do a lot of rewrites to find it, or right. you have like a natural storytelling ability like where you were doing it subconsciously. Like I think that's what a lot of writers end up doing is that they're doing it subconsciously. But if you can make it conscious, then you can save yourself some, some time is my... Just to add on to that, I, I actually agree with Lexi that it's probably a good idea to figure out what your theme is if you really want to go there because for, for me my theory is the inner need is the theme the theme of your story is almost always connected to the inner That's need right. of the protagonist right mm -hmm. and if right. you don't know what That's your right. inner need is um your or at least where the protagonist growth is yeah. going from you're probably not designing it as intentionally as possible um you're right there, there's a pair yeah absolutely there's a parallel between thematic theme and inner needs uh, michelle's got something here what yeah. is this um, but I just want to add quickly. Uh, Please do. Sometimes yeah. you'll you'll have a, th a theme in mind, and you'll go into it with a theme in mind, and then as you as you write, you will surprise yourself with something else, where mm -hmm. it isn't necessarily an all or nothing situation. Sometimes 
sometimes you go in not knowing what it's about and then you discover it and then you have to go back and make sure it's properly seated. But sometimes <laughs> you are saying something very explicitly, you are saying something, but then have an epiphany partway through that maybe what you're saying is a little bit more elaborate or a little bit, or a little bit off kilter from what you thought you were saying. And um, that's kind of how this movie feels a little bit to me because it, you know, for most of its runtime, and of course it's a mitigating circumstance that it's based on a short story and actually already has a roadmap for this. But for most of the story, it is about trust and it is about communication and all of these concepts. And then by the end, it's about, you know, choosing to, you know, enjoy life, even knowing that it will go, but even knowing that it will go poorly. And kind of that moment where it connects, where if you have the big question of, are risks worth taking if they might potentially lead to, you know, despair, like when they're dealing with aliens, like, should we continue this or should we just assume the worst and just react accordingly? And the answer is, even if you know definitively that it will end poorly, that doesn't necessarily mean that you should pr protect yourself from that. And it feels it like, while you're watching it, it gives you as the viewer the feeling of discovering that epiphany, that shift from one theme to the other mm -hmm. that maybe you might have as a writer while you're writing it. I agree. Yeah, no, I, I, I it's, it's a beautiful story. Michelle's got, um, yeah, I love this, Michelle. It's interesting how this it one? reflects. Yeah. Uh, yes. It's interesting how it reflects society as being scared of strange beings, and how they can actually help us better versus how Twilight Zone has an episode of humans being optimistic. Michelle, I love that. I mean, you're absolutely right. As I was watching it, you know, and they're different. They're different. Therefore, they must be dangerous. Therefore, they must be confrontational. Well, it depends on what the philosophy great, of the writer. Great message, huh? It depends on the philosophy of the writer, right? Like, even in this situation where it is an adaptation, Eric Heiser made a very specific change to the story uh, that he that he's adapting. Because in the story that he's adapting the daughter dies age 25 in a mountain climbing accident. And that's a very deterministic viewpoint of like things will happen regardless of what you want, of you, what you intend to happen. Mm -hmm. um, your choices are already sort of determined. And Eric Heiser philosophically doesn't agree with that. He believes that we make choices. So he changed it to, uh, you know, to she dies younger from something that, that couldn't have just been prevented through a phone call. Uh, you know, don't go mountain climbing today. Um, and that's sort of a very specific philosophical difference. It's a fortune cookie, and isn't it? I think a, a little bit, right? You know, like one one version is you know choosing to have the baby, and the other one is choosing to have the baby, know, knowing that the baby will die in an accident, and you cannot pick up the phone to call. You know, like it, it gets it gets a little bit more in the weeds, and that kind of extends to the general idea of looking at aliens either as, either as you know we should make peace with them or we should make war with them. What is the what does the writer believe? You know, like there's there. I think is... the writer's approach. I think what it, I, what I took is what Michelle is saying is that that because they're different than we are, they must be bad. Right, you know, and that's what's fascinating because you have yeah. so many stories where it isn't where the writer fully believes and believes it's heroic to believe that you should defend yourself against outsiders at all costs. Right. And then you, you know, have writers I, like Ted Chiang and, and Eric Heiser who believe otherwise. It's hearing Avi describe this, it makes me wonder if Eric, if the writer of the short story and if Eric, like what their religious views yes, are. Yes, yes, Because yes. it reminds me of the argument about free will. Like, do we really have free will if some divine being knows the outcome, like knows what you're gonna do? Like if like if the if the path is set, do you have free will at all? And like that whole thing interacting, like that question. And it seems like the writer is saying of the short story is saying like even if even knowing that this is where it's going, like you still like have a a choice in that. Like so, the mountain climbing accident was more like it's yeah. <laughs> uh, it's hard to explain. <laughs> it starts getting into a bunch of like very like it's a versus free will. Yeah. So um, my, my just quick uh, on this before we move on to the subject, I think this story is very much about humanism and about the promise and the PR person. <laughs> it is a PR piece for humanism and us coming together and overcoming our animal tribal xenophobic 
you know, Im animal impulses of, oh, I'm afraid of things that are different. So I'm going to kill it, you know, like, and I'm going right. to be frag right. fragmented, different nations, all different rather than the 12 coming together. Humanism is about, you know, we're all human beings. Uh, morality comes from well shared well-being and understanding and communication. And this story is uh, optimistic in that it's about us coming together to trust. embrace the unknown through trust, yep. communication, yeah. these ideas. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know this guy like came out. Soldier who kills everyone. I freaking hate yeah. that guy. He should be like uh, court martialed <laughs> and shit. You know. I, I know. So. I mean, this movie, say, this movie came out a week after the 2016 election, and really, I think it's, I yeah, it came out. It came out <laughs> November of 2016, and it was quite the thing to experience in theaters, wasn't it? You know, like I feel like th yeah. that's part of why it potentially hit as much as it did. That need for like we need to have something that tells us that actually, even if we're not there yet even if we can't trust trust each other in the moment, we have the capacity to do so. It's very optimistic. So real quick, I wanted to it address is very optimistic. Yeah. from Michelle. She asked, is it a moral choice to have the daughter knowing she will suffer through cancer treatment and die? Did the daughter learn her mom made that choice? Did Jeremy Renner know? Did Amy not say? Amy didn't tell Jeremy Renner and that's why they divorced. Amy Adams knew that the daughter was going to die of a rare disease. I don't think it was cancer. Um, and it doesn't seem, she didn't tell Jeremy Renner until after the fact. And that's why they divorced. And that's why they're like estranged now. I don't know if he, she told the daughter or not. That part's not clear. Uh, it doesn't seem like. Doesn't so, seem like but, but I, I think the question is about the moral choice of, it's well, that a, too. Yeah. Is it is it a moral to choose to give birth to somebody knowing that they're going to suffer and die of cancer. That depends on your philosophical beliefs. You know, for me personally, I don't, I'm not as convinced of anything other than life existing or reincarnation or anything like that. Um, I think existing is better than not existing probably. Um, so yeah. the fact that the girl got to live it all, I don't know. Is it a pro-life movie? Uh, I, I, I don't well, think I mean, it's not, it, it makes a position on that. Uh, well, it's I don't a, think it's pro-life in the way that you're saying, in the way that you're poking, but it, no. it does seem like a pro, <laughs> like an existence, like the existence, it, like the journey is worth the dust is more important than the yeah. destination. Movie. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it, it's saying it's saying you know we will all die, and just because we know it doesn't mean that life wasn't worth it. Yeah, you know, um, and it's clearly it's clearly open for debate because they they make the conscious choice of. Ian leaves her because he disagrees. So clearly it is up for debate and they are aware of the fact that it's up yeah. for debate. But as Eric Heiser put it in one of his interviews, you know, better to have, better to love and lose than to never have Hannah at all is the choice that he comes down to. And that's a very strong specific argument that the movie makes very yeah. loudly. Like this is what we believe. Here's the question and here's the answer that we have, you know? That's right. Well, I feel like this reminds me of the whole, like, our approach to theme, having it be a thematic question and giving each character a valid answer. Like, I don't necessarily leave this movie thinking that Adam, Amy Adams is, is right. I think that she made a valid choice and that like, I can understand why other people, why Jeremy Renner doesn't like it. You know, like it, it like it poses the question and then we like have- She questions. was right because if she didn't give birth to the child, she wouldn't have been able to have the insight to solve this and bring humanity together, right? That's the implication. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's also a structural re like reason behind why I think the movie's saying that she's right. And it's because it starts off with the tragedy, right? The opening yeah. sequence is, right. here is her daughter dying. And then the end of the movie is, but if I could do it all over again, I would, you know? Um, right. it, it's, uh, to me that, that feels definitive, but they leave enough room open for a conversation where I feel like they are saying it is okay to disagree with the movie. <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel, so this is where I'm getting a little like picky. I think that Which she, way? I think that it's not say like, this is what she did. And therefore this is what happened. I think is the thing it's saying. Like, I don't think it's necessarily saying that this is like the right call. And I think the whole, the thing Jeremy Renner is what opens that up. Is that it's like it's saying that this is what happened and this is what was always going to happen, therefore it happened, and that, but that it like it is 
based on this choice that was <laughs> it's complicated. It's, it's complicated. A, it's a complicated. It is complicated. It feels to me. It feels to me like an endorsement because the final lines of the movie are, "Would you like to have? Uh, do you want to make a baby?" And then cut to her smiling and saying, "Yeah." And then cut to black. Um, right. it, to me, that feels like a period at the end of a sentence. But I could. But like, it's all valid. Like what you're saying, Alexi, makes total sense to me. Also, it's just really interesting what the intention might have been. I'd say I'm probably wonder, philosophically aligned with the writer on um, in terms of how they maybe were intending it to come off. Like I would think right. it's moral because of the overall. Like I thought it would be essential to her succeeding in mm -hmm. achieving the goal. Well, they make a point in the short story, uh, which Alexi, you can tell me if this is as accurate as I'm told. Um, that part of the factor in the decision to have her in the first place is that in her life she will consequentially affect other people too that Hannah's existence will affect other, will touch other people, and therefore, like, she is important, uh, which is less a factor in the movie yeah. itself, but, like, that's in the short story, right? I, you know, yeah. And, I mean, they make her older. She gets to be older and have more interactions with people in the in the short story. Like, 25 is a long time to be interacting with people versus the way they did it in the, the film. Which, John, what were you about to also, say? There's also sorry. a, oh, sorry. I was just going to say that it, it must have been a, a hard film for the studio to green light because this is a, um, I mean, I, I, you know, there's, there's, there's a moment with any film when the studio is getting ready to, to um, execute uh, a pre-production and they start signing these enormous checks and those checks go out. And there's this 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 moment at the studio when they bring everybody in the room and go, let's find a reason not to make this movie. Because we're scared to death that we're putting $80 million on the line. And a lot of movies get stopped at that point. You know, I hate to say it, but I've been in that room when they killed a movie just at the last, last, last second. So... This film, as I'm watching it, and and because it's heady, and because it's making a statement, and the statement may statement may alienate some people, maybe not. Um, uh, it's sci-fi, which is another uh, can be another issue. I, I'm just I'm, I I would love to know. Is I don't think there's any way. Uh, actually, I know, a little bit. I know a little bit about this actually. Oh, you do. Yeah, because the the writer one of the one of the things that I love about this writer is one of my favorite works. Does the writer know that you're stalking him, by the way? Or <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> probably. Um, but he uh, he's very candid in interviews about the process of his movies. Like when when a movie that he works on doesn't go well, he will talk about what went wrong. Oh, cool. um, you know, he he he's done a lot of horror sequels and remakes um, that have gone poorly, and he's kind of been open as to why. Um, with with Arrival, apparently he had a rough time getting it off the ground until he had a movie that did well. Um, he wrote and directed a movie called um, Hours, I think it was called, or The Hours. Oh. Um, which no, it's not The Hours. It's a, it's a different one, John. Oh, it's oh, Hours okay. in 2013. It's a, it was a, a movie about a, like a father and Katrina um, sort of in the midst of the hurricane. Um, and that did well. And then people were willing to listen to him. And apparently producers at 21 Laps were aware of the short story and found it powerful and were willing to sort of develop it. And then Denis Villeneuve comes on and suddenly it's a go movie because this director has so much clout from his past successes. Right. Um, so that was helpful. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I hear what you're saying though. Like this is not an obvious sell. Like it, yeah. it is technically IP, but it's not franchise IP. Uh, it's a mid budget movie. It's about linguistics, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's, um, it's got a lot. Yeah, it's got a lot. Can going we talk in. about it's how curious. great it looks? How great it oh, looks gorgeous. for thirty-seven oh, million dollars? Like it looks like a hundred million dollar movie. Like it is looks it, incredible. It 30, was it made for thirty-seven? 47. Yeah, forty-seven. They got a lot of bang for their buck because like, like it, looks it looks gorgeous. like a hundred million dollar movie. Like yeah, it looks. Yeah. Incredible. They made a lot of really smart choices there with like the way that they represented because like the way that the aliens are depicted is different than in the than in the short story and the way they did it is really because it was a lot more like just like aliens in a room like with like furniture like talking through a glass to them and mm -hmm. this like really i feel like they got away with a lot by like making them like mysterious and like putting them like further back and having it be more mm -hmm. it was just it was smart and i think it was a more interesting choice 
in the short story, it's like Skype, right? Like they're doing it from a distance. It's like Skype, but it, the alien technology is so good that it looks like they're there. Right, it's like, but aliens and are not on Earth. They're like in the sky and then they have a looking glass on earth. And also John, you would like this. Instead of there being 12, there's 120 looking glasses all over the world. There and then the movie, there's 12. <laughs> so yeah. it's- I wonder if that yeah. happened. Well, but yeah. also there is a smart idea to have the aliens be there in person on earth because then you get to rile up, you know, the world, everybody's freaked out by them as yeah. opposed to, Aliens exist, and from a distance, they are talking to us. Well, now they're in the room, and now we're scared because what are they? Oh, they were like hovering above, I think. So it was still like everyone was still like, eh. but yeah, it was better that they were, I think, on the almost. And can we ground. talk for a moment about how brilliant Denis uh, Villeneuve is as a director? Like, <laughs> so holy good. shit! Oh, there is a scene. There is a so scene good. that changed dr drastically through editing that I learned about today. Oh yeah, where. You know, yeah, where you know a whole lot of things were condensed to that little montage in the middle with um, Jeremy Renner explaining things. Um, but there's one scene that they shot, but they had to cut for time, where the general says to uh, Amy Adams, uh, "We like you're you're getting too into this, and you're clearly overworked, and so we're taking you off. We're concerned about your mental well-being." And she fights back and says, uh, no, I'm not unfit to do this. And she has to like, convince him to let her stay. And they decided to cut out the scene because it took too much time. But then they realized, oh, but there's there's important information in that scene. There's stuff we need to explain. They talk about the superior wharf hypothesis. So what they decided to do is they cut down that scene significantly, removed the general from it, and replaced him digitally with an alien in the room and made it a dream oh, scene. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, it's the scene where <laughs> Jeremy Renner says, hey, are you are you dreaming in their language? And then she gets defensive, oh, which she's right. getting defensive. Originally, that's her saying to the general, don't take me off. Um, you know, and she says, oh, my God. I'm not oh, unfit good. to do this work. And now and he, now it's it's almost like she's saying it to herself, like she's trying to convince herself. And then the alien is in the room, like it's in her mind. But that was that was an edit. That was a choice they made after the fact. Smart. That makes yeah, a lot more sense because she seemed yeah. to go from, like, she seemed more worked up than the situation quite <laughs> merited in that moment so that makes yeah. that makes sense it's fascinating to me oh and by the way just entirely just a pragmatic element sort of from a production standpoint as to why the daughter can't be 25 when she dies um that gives away the game because then you have to age up amy adams um yeah. when in those right. scenes and then we're all aware of the fact and so it's, it's something to think about if you're ever adapting a short story, what works on the page in a short story might not work in a movie. Mm -hmm. Wait, or, or, or if you're, you have a short story or a book, you know, anything you're adapting, you know, what are these choices you make? Um, where does it lend itself to a film? Where doesn't it? And, and how, what are you going to have to invent? And that's, that's, um, you know, that's a big part of being successful with adaptation. Yeah. Yeah, um, the the uh, composer, the music. Uh, uh, he died, composer, right? Like, yeah, he he passed in twenty eighteen, um, which is such a shame because like the music in this movie is just so beautiful. Cool. Yeah, I yeah. actually was a fan of him. His like before he started got into soundtracks. Like I had an album of his in two thousand eight, oh, wow. Johan really? Johansson, and it was this it was this what? great <laughs> album called Fordlandia, and it was about when Ford tried to build like a town about in, in South America and it was like a conceptual orchestral piece. I was into weird shit in high school, but um, <laughs> it's like really weird, weird, like uh, ambient music. And I was always looking for like music to listen to, to write and feel vibed out to, but um, yeah, don't read into that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, I'm going to read into it. <laughs> yeah, no, but yeah, he's, he's, yeah. he's, he was so talented and it's just such a shame he he also did the what? soundtrack for Theory of Everything yeah. uh, with uh, the Stephen Hawking movie. Someone else was saying that he did Sicario. Sicario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great movie. With the same director. Is that? Uh, oh, is that what it is? Yeah. Was he young? Yeah. Was he young, Adam? Forty. Yeah, he was like in his uh, yeah forties. Yeah. That sucks. Mm. Stupid. Yeah. Heroin, I think. Really. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I knew those film composers lived hard, you know. <laughs> so yeah, the um, there's this whole conversation happening in the comments about whether the daughter knew. And like, um, 
in the short story, they're more clear that the daughter has very, very different interests than the mother. So she probably would have never learned the language. She's into finance. But beyond that, I think that the point in the, so like the short story might have a different answer, but I think in the film, the answer is it doesn't matter, which might be a little bit harsh, but like that's kind of the stance that the film takes is that it's not about whether the daughter knew it's about oh, like Louise mostly and then secondarily uh, Donnelly. Right. And, um, and it's just, it's about the fact that, I don't know. Like, that's where I'm like, I feel like she was always going to be on this journey and she's just kind of accepting that this is where it is. And in a way, like she still made the choice, but it was already, it was also already determined because the time was already, like it was already around her that she had made this yeah. choice. So it's like the answer is almost like it doesn't, like it was like a choice that was a non-choice and it doesn't. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, she's kind of a non-character if you think about it, like just from a functional standpoint, um, because she never makes any choices, um, Anna. Right. She's really more of a concept, right? She's really more of a like, like, it, just in in terms of thinking about what does every character in a story do for the story. Um, I like I wouldn't put her as a you know a friend or a foe or you know anything like that. She's she's a concept. She's a question. The question of should she should she exist, um, and right. what do you do with her? Um, and she's well used in that way. But yeah, yeah, very, yeah. very. Yeah. Uh, but I think sort of the fact that she's she lacks agency, and it's okay that she lacks agency because she isn't you know in the main cast. She isn't she isn't sort of a mover or shaker in the story we're actually telling. Um, to me, that tells me that she doesn't she doesn't know um, about her situation because if you know, you do something about it, or you choose to not do something about it, and then it's a choice. She's kept away from all that. Yeah, also, she's like used. Go ahead. Watch. Like whether she chooses to do something about it or not, it doesn't change what happens, right? Because like whatever she chose to do already happened by the time for Amy Adams, right? Whatever whatever the daughter chose to do about it already existed in the world where Amy Adams was making these choices. So it's like any choice she was gonna make was made based. No, it's <laughs> it's all very. <laughs> You know, uh, time travel. God damn it! Yeah, <laughs> it's like the theory of time travel that anything that's going to be changed has already been changed, and that it's like right. all existing at once. And so it's, it's just, like, just yeah, they just chose to run with that understanding of time, and you just kind of have to accept that that's the the version of time that we're going to be playing with in this world. Yeah. Avi, did you say it's the anti-river? It's the anti-looper. Looper. Oh, anti-looper. Hey. Yeah. Oh, anti <laughs> that's true. We did too. Uh, do you think because of what happened to Jeremy Renner in here, do you think that's why he went off and became a bomb expert and hurt locker? Do you think that's... <laughs> I'm angry. I'm going to go to... I'm Iraq. pissed off and I'm going to... Yeah. To, yeah. yeah. I think it's go. why he learned archery. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. I forgot yeah. Jeremy Renner was in the movie after I watched the movie. Um, he, I don't know. He's very like blank for me. I, I don't. He's really like care. there, but he's a non-character too, almost. <laughs> like, he's, he's an ally, and that's about it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but he works well in that in that regard. I mean, you need him in the movie. No, he does. I just like as an actor, I find him very, um, you know, whatever. I just don't connect with him personally. Danny's gonna I'll let him know next time here. I see him. Next time I see him, I'll, I'll let him yeah, know. Tell him. He'll, yeah, he'll tell him. Tell Jeremy. Him. You know, you were kind of blank in that, that movie. You don't do anything for me as an actor, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I, I, will say, I will say, though, just about, about Jeremy Renner's character, like, I think it, it's it's sort of important to have him in a position where he's just sort yes. of, like, supportive but not yeah. driving because yeah. we need to believe that by the end of the story that Amy Adams would be into him and that she's making the choices, Right. Like she chooses to be with him, she chooses to have a kid with him, and if he's a more dynamic character, then that kind of takes a little bit away from her, in a way. Yeah. This is a good question. I like this question. Yeah, it's a really good question. So, do you think this think, film aims for the heart or for the head, John? Well, oh, John. Okay. Well, uh, I think it aims. I think it aims for the heart. Yeah, I think. I think. Um, 
Amy Adams character, they, they, they get you, they got me. I mean, I'm, um, I, I responded to it emotionally first, intellectually second. Yeah, I think, the, I think it uses the head to get to the heart. Like when I walk out of this movie, I don't talk to my friends about, so what do you think are the implications of the superior Worf hypothesis? I, I, I ask, do you think it was right for her to have the kid? You know? Right. Right. And, and just regarding this, that specific uh, question um, is for writing the feature lesson, I think, that where um, I talk about oh. Chuck Palahniuk's theory about when you introduce a character or a protagonist, either appealing to the head or the heart, like, oh, this person's brilliant and worth following, or for X, Y, and Z, like, in, you know, or, or something really emotional and, like, so you can empathize with them. I think that in this story, we meet Luis four minutes, really emotional, her bond with her daughter. Yeah and her lost from the daughter. So yeah. I would say heart. I'm gonna expose myself a bit. It was totally head for me. I didn't walk away like, was that the right choice? I was like, this is really freaking cool. Like, I really like this language thing. I think that's really neat. I think the way that they're playing with time is really cool. And I, it took me multiple watches to understand what the F was going on with the daughter. Like, I just couldn't, for some reason, I must've just been looking at the wrong things. But it was like, for me, it was a hundred percent the thing that was Lexi, feeling. Well, what I was talking about, just to clarify, to the, yeah, just to clarify, I was talking about how they introduce her character. Like, oh I no, 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 I know. Film. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I was responding more to Avi's point about when he left. His question for his mm. friends was, "Did she make the right uh, choice?" Mine mm. was, "That was really freaking cool." How would we handle oh, alien agree. language? I agree. I, I'm Let, on the same page. Alexi, as you, like, don't you normally yeah, respond to you? You no, normally respond to films with your heart, don't you? Yes, but I like time travel and space a lot. <laughs> I know you. So do. that is my. That's like my. I will always be distracted. You want that. to go to Mars, right? Yes, I want to go really? to Mars. Yes, Mars I would go. Terrible. It's it just sounds a like death anything. trap. Have you seen the Martian? Looks terrible. <laughs> Have you seen the expanse? Mars seems yeah. actually it seems no, Mars terrible. seems terrible but in the expanse. God. Earth does too though, so really it's all relative. Earth is better than the expanse. Earth is like the best place to be in the universe of the expanse. <laughs> like everywhere else sucks. Adam, you like living here? <laughs> what? And where and where, where, on, where on Earth is the best place to be, Adam? I mean well in the universe of the expanse, um it's just it's just the nebulous uh Probably Montana. Aruba, Montana, probably, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I really don't New know York the City, answer. The best place in the universe. That's uh, definitely not true. Um. <laughs> Michelle cries at everything, but she didn't cry here. Okay, Michelle. Yeah. Uh. I you never know, I cry. I didn't this. cry at this either. Just Let's plug like, the expanse for a second. Let's plug the, if you the haven't seen the I show. Seen the the, I don't know the expanse. Is the expanse? John, you would love it. Good. John, you would love the show because it's all about <laughs> obstacles, it's all about stakes. It's really good. It's really smart science fiction. Um, I don't know. It's well it's, done. It's about like, it's probably like 30 years from now. The idea, like it's like set up like that, I think. Or maybe it's set a little more in the future. But the idea is that we've colonized the asteroid belt and Mars. And so now we have a world, like we have like three bases of, for humans, the, the asteroid belt, Mars and Earth. And it's about the politics. It's really political while being set in like a very like grounded hard sci-fi of what life would be like in the Avi, do you like The Expanse? I uh, I watched the first two episodes and I actually couldn't connect with it. Um, which I, 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 I ascribe to it. I ascribe to a taste thing. I just couldn't connect it. Um, I was waiting for a character to suck me in. Um, but so you're an emotional like, guy, you know, Avi. You like, I, you like I, the I, heartbeat. Well, it, it's part of why I'm a horror guy. You know, I like I like mm. genre that exposes something about the human condition versus. I love the con conceptual stuff, but like as I've said before, there was a recent, very big, heady sci-fi uh, movie that was enti went entirely for the head, and I just could not connect with it even in the slightest. Um, so it it is a, there is a show that I'm watching now that is a sci-fi show that does both that I just adore um, called For All Mankind, which is an alternate history of the space. Where the concept is, what if the first man on the moon was actually um, a Russian, and what does that do to the American space race? And so there is the intellectual concept of what would the program be like, and what would the science involved look like. 
But it does all of this to comment on social, you know, situations. Like, what does this do for feminism? What does this do for except just tolerance in general? What does it do for masculinity? Um, and that's why it works for me because it uses the head to get to the heart. But that's just me personally. I disagree with Michelle. I think science can't go too far necessarily. Um, I think science is just knowledge, right? And how it, I don't think I I think some people believe like oh you can have there, you, we can know too much. I don't think we can know too much. Wait, did um, you see the statement that's above that one though that she was oh, referring? Yeah, to? sending sperm to the moon. I what's I, I don't understand why. why it, well, we want to know how sperm would uh, survive in space, is right, right? Oh, well, we can that's know all, things. Yeah, that's I mean, fine. That's, all, that's like that's good information to know. To know. That's it good information like to know. Sounds like something a man would do. I'm being honest. <laughs> we can change. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! There we went. But, okay, just, but just on the subject, though, sharp lift I think that this kind of connects back to our early question about like the perspective that a writer brings to their work. That is their own personal belief that colors it. Because in the 1950s, you have all of these sci-fi movies where it's where they're jingoistic and kind of anti-science where it's like the scientists who had just created the atomic bomb are causing problems that we really need to ascribe to order so like you take the thing from another world in the 1950s the villain is a scientist who wants to study the alien and the heroes are the soldiers who want to blow it up and right, that right. that was the belief that uh, Abby, the captain kirk had. right it's captain kirk the hothead on the stop say, saying, shut up, Spock, I'm going to follow my gut, you know? Yeah, it, like, <laughs> and that's the belief of the writer. And then you have something like this, where it's like, the soldiers are mucking everything up. We need to talk to them. Um, you, come at, you, you have to come at your story with a perspective instead of trying to figure out what you think your audience's perspective might be. Like, figure out what, are, what, what do you believe? And then tell the story through that lens. Mm -hmm. I think it's okay. interesting, Avi, that like when you say that you like movies with heart, you're talking about horror, and well, I understand I the too. argument. I find it fascinating. But I feel like well, that's not a common the best, argument. The best horror movies, I think, can engender empathy more viscerally and more directly than other genres because you are fe feeling an immediate feeling that a character on screen is experiencing, um, and and so it is can... emotional. Like I when I when when somebody on screen is terrified, they're not thinking about hmm. This is a concept of fear. It is interesting that this alien has this kind of jaw. It's like no, no, no. They are terrified in their hearts, and if you tell if you tell your story right, you make your audience feel the same thing, and then you're connecting to the choices these characters are making, and that helps you connect to a person. I think so. That's that's horror for me. Horror is an emotional genre. Sci-fi can be a much more heady genre, and I do love a good heady story, but the ones that really connect with me have something to say about you know the human condition on an emotional level, personally. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, just to clarify, um, scientists are sending both seed sperm and egg samples to the moon <laughs> to sort of, as sort of a buffer for like, okay, what if uh, we kill ourselves? It's like a global insurance policy to make sure that we have enough uh, eggs and Adam. sperm in a place Adam. that are disconnected. Yeah. I just wanted to like, make sure. It's, like, we... it's like, here's the concept of empathy in movies. Okay, that's interesting. So anyway, the theme in the <laughs> No, I think Adam I Adam doesn't need, necessarily need a segue. He's not, you know, he'll go. Adam's not a segue, man. You, you, yeah. had, a, you had a full stop, and I was <laughs> just all over my next paragraph. You know, I mean, you, you put a period on your sentence, Avi, and, and Adam said, okay, let's start over. Let's go let's back to the is, it is, Dallas, That's part of the as much as Elon Musk is like Elon friggin' Musk, he does have a good point about the fact that like, it's a little terrifying when you think about the fact that if we are the only life in the universe, Earth is it right now, right? Like we're not, right. we're not anywhere else. So by putting something of us on the moon, I can see that it would be like a back, it's like a USB, it's a flash drive that you're saving just in case your entire computer melts. It's like, Sperm is like a flash drive. Oh, and okay. Alexi, how does that make you feel? How does that make me feel? How does that make you feel? Like I get the concept of it is good to you know we got to expand the humanity humanity beyond the, beyond this planet, but how does that make you feel? I just think it's interesting. See, I don't have a heart reaction. So you, I just think it's you didn't feel. You didn't have a feel. feel. You didn't have a yeah. I never feel. I love um, personal stakes on this. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder what. Well, never mind. I yeah. Just I wonder what they're. Adam, can you find out what are they keeping the sperm in up there? 
I, it's like an I, it's like some sort of repository. I didn't. I just looked at the headline. I will read it later. Um, I'll send you a full detailed book report, John. Um, okay. No, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> But, it, but it's interesting, and, and uh, Michelle brought up another point, sort of like maybe what she feels uneasy about is like sort of the unethical experiments and sort of the way scientists and the community goes about obtaining this knowledge, I think is sometimes unethical and unmoral. So I would say my position as a humanist is that my uh, I value the well-being of individuals and communities over our desire for knowledge that improves. Like science is a way to create well-being and help us thrive. And if it in any way impedes that, I find that uh, morally objectable. So I don't believe in unethical experiments. Um, Sorry, this is, is a conversation, a Adam, and I've had a lot talking about humanism and theory of like our philosophy. Of yeah, I'm a by the book yeah. humanist probably. Um, that's yeah. something I, I, that's very important to me. Um, Science Until is I'm proven it wrong. Exists, it, it's, it exists whether <laughs> we use it or not. And then the question yes. is just how do you use it? Yeah. That well mm -hmm. said. Yeah. Um, Man, what a freaking convo we had today. I don't know if this, this is pretty good. good. This, this is really really good. Good. fascinating. fascinating. But, uh, somebody earlier brought up that, you know, this great movies do this, right? They, they make us yes, ask yes. questions. They, great art does this. Great stories do that. You know, they don't just like a film that doesn't, have that same i don't want to say importance but that same question driving force you know it's sort of like oh well that was well constructed x y and z but like this film is a vehicle for more substantial things um which isn't to say that the other type of story is bad or worse or anything but i think that these are important and it's fewer of these movies are made than That's movies right. that are like you know i don't want to say yeah escape is can you think, think of other films already. in this category what? Can you think of other films that like would fit in this category? Like I was just trying to think of something that I would like liken to this in the same way. I can immediately think of twenty other science fiction films that do not do this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think remember yeah, that film Sunshine, that. Avi? Do you remember that film Sunshine? I do. I do remember Sunshine. Boy, it, becomes, it becomes a slasher. Somebody yeah, much they... earlier mentioned uh, Slaughterhouse Five. Yeah, that. Uh, uh, that was which I haven't, I haven't read or seen. I haven't read the book or seen the film in years and years. But, but, but you know, based on, um, God, I just blanked on his name. Just Kurt Vonnegut on. and I, Vonnegut, just uh, Vonnegut, uh, based on his his experience in the war in Dresden. And uh, I remember reading the book before I saw the film. But the the book is is extraordinary, and 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 in this way. Uh, very provocative, very, uh, um, you know, it has, it has the same concept of time also. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I think this is really literary. I think it's a really literary experience yeah. to just present something to someone and like, just like let it be what it is. And then it starts conversations. I think it's much more common in literature than it is in film. And, and I think also that's you'll what see I in the theater in theater, you know, you go to a play <laughs> And, and this goes back to the conversations I have sometimes with students about, uh, you know, um, you've got this 115, 120 pages to tell your story, is that your audience, this, this is the counter argument, this film is the counter to, to, to this conversation, but um, I think Arrival is an exception, but the audience for a novel is different, the audience for theater is different the audience for film is different so what that the audience brings to the party what they bring to the genre to the to the the entertainment um uh is different expectations and different willingness to commit so you buy a book you spend 27 bucks you're gonna it may take you 15 hours 20 hours whatever to read it you're you're you you don't say to me I'm going to sit down. I've got my popcorn. You better entertain me or I'm going to be really pissed off. <laughs> um, in the theater, same thing. You're going to spend a lot of money and it might be three hours, might be four hours. Uh, you're going to be uncomfortable in that seat. And so the audience, the, the audience's uh, willingness to participate is much different for, for these different venues. And, and we have to be mindful of that as filmmakers, again, arrival is the exception is, I think an exception to the rule, but. Right, and part of that is when you're starting your story, when you're telling your story, 
what expectations are you giving your audience? Yeah. Are you are you telling your audience up front this is going to be a heady story, or are you telling them it's going to be a visceral one or something else? You know, it's uh, you you have control over what the audience thinks this movie will be for a while, and then you lose that control because eventually they've already created their expectations based on what they've seen so far. Mm -hmm. I me of 2001 Space Odyssey a little bit, but better. I, I, I like this movie better than 2001. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 2001 always, it struck me as kind of, like, it's it's beautiful. It struck me as, as a colder story because it isn't necessarily yeah. oh, um, a very course. human one. And meanwhile, Arrival is about... I, I didn't mean on a personal... Um, Am I breaking up or are you breaking more up? More like it was trying to articulate it. And I was talking... Oh, Adam, we're losing, <laughs> we're losing you a little. We're losing you a little, Adam. Sorry. Now you're back. Wait, now you're back, I think. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. sorry about that. Oh. Um, I was Okay, so I was just saying um, the, the only reason I brought up 2001 was as of... Uh, um, kind of. Am I back? Clap yeah. your hands or something. We'll see if you're Hello? back in sync. Oh God! Oh no! Okay, you caught up. You there caught you up go. a little. There you go. <laughs> yeah, you're back. Okay. Sorry, I, that was a weird. <laughs> I forgot what I was gonna say. I, Clapping <laughs> fixed it somehow. <laughs> I will say, like when, when I started, I was I showed this because uh, I've seen this movie a couple times. When I was rewatching it, I showed it to my sister and her boyfriend who had not seen it, and it was interesting watching what their expectations for it were when it started. Like there was a point early on where my sister Tova said. Oh, this this so far kind of feels like Annihilation, which is a science fiction movie by Alex Garland, and the two diverge pretty spectacularly, but they do kind of have a similar grounding, where it's it's these big intellectual concepts, but how they relate to a human emotion. So in that mm. one, it was about kind of depression and self destruction, um, but through this bizarre kind of thing that needs to be studied. Um, so that's an example of a sci fi movie in this sort of vein. Although that one gets quite visceral. I have a suggestion actually, Gattaca with mm -hmm. Ethan Hawke mm -hmm. and Uma Thurman. Oh God, yeah. That is such a great film, the way they balance sort of like the intellectual philosophical um, sort of questions about what like ethical ethics of gene manipulation and sort of knowing the future about somebody like the day they'll die and exactly how and how that determines like class, but with a very human story about like wanting to achieve something despite that it's about Ethan Hawke, knowing he's got, a, got heart disease or that it's going to kill him, he wants to be an astronaut anyway. Yeah. Um, and it's this mm -hmm. really amazing movie. Um, underrated, I think. Um, right. Highly I'm recommend. Funny, no one no. It. So Danny which said, is which is more difficult to do, adapting short stories or full-length books? Um, I've, I've kind of done, I, I, I've done both back in the day. And um, uh, with a book, um, the um, you know the the, the trade off or the, the 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 approach has to be you've got uh, you've probably heard me say this before forgive me if if you have but you've got maybe a four hundred page book so you've got to go through your first pass and find the pins that you're going to hang the story on so the inciting incident might happen on page one hundred and twenty well that's a problem. What are you going to do with, you know, those hundred pages that you've got to cut out? Um, and, and, and it's also great fun. It's great fun, fun to do, to adapt a, a good book. Um, Cause so much is given to you and, and, you know, then you also, what's not there. What, what's not happening. What do I have to invent? Um, the, the, it's somewhat different. Uh, I did this with a short, uh, I've done this with a short story, a somewhat different approach is there's so little there that the, the I'll, I'll say with that, the, the pins that you're hanging the movie on, um, there's not enough in between them because in a short story, there's just so little time. Maybe it's 10, 15 pages. Now you've got to think expansively. You've got to think they gave me a, 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 a protagonist with an objective but there's no conflict. I have to build out a second act. How do I do that? So, so the two approaches, it's, it's really, when you melt it down, it's, um, it's, it's what are you giving me with regards to how am I gonna hang the story and what do I have to invent or what do I have to remove? So it's, it's yeah. 
slightly different variations on the same thing. Yeah, you know, part of the question is how do we remain true to the source material? And I think that kind of comes down to forget the specifics, forget forget the the surface stuff, like you know the like specific characters and scenarios. What is this? What is the source trying to say? Mm. And are you are you also saying that? And sometimes your intention might be to completely subvert it, like the Starship Troopers movie, which is based on the Starship Troopers novel by uh, by Heinlein. The novel is pretty unironically fascistic. And the movie becomes a sort of a satire of fascism. Um, and that was a conscious choice. Um, so it depends on what are you trying to, are, are, like, do you want to be true to the source material or do you want to comment on it? Um, and some, you know, it, it really depends on the situation that you're in. Well, and, and what inspires you. So sometimes you find a, a, a novel or a short story and again, it's inspirational. The inspiration will come, Avi, from, from, um, it's intellectual properties. What's, what's, yeah. what's, what it's saying. And you go, this is, this is why I'm inspired to take this to the next level. Um, but somebody here said, and I think it's interesting. Yeah. It would be interesting to do a class on, on adaptation. Um, I know yeah. a, small, a small section of writing the feature dedicated to it. And a lot of the films that we look at and writing the feature are adaptations. Cause we look at arrival, which again, if you read the script, it's a pretty like direct, it's interesting that it can be so direct for a short story, but it's it's very direct um, with like a few minor changes that don't like change the overall shape of the story. But then like Jojo Rabbit, he added imaginary Hitler that was not in the book that it was based on. Like that was a big change, you know? And there's just like tons of different, we talk about it a little bit and writing the feature, not a whole, not a whole thing. One of the, yeah, one of the big fail failures, which is an interesting one, and and uh, uh, Bonfire of the Vanities, Tom Wolfe's novel, which is a great novel and very long. I don't know, maybe I don't know. It's a great read though, maybe six hundred page. I don't know what it is, but it's a great read. And the movie, um, uh, De Palma directed it. The movie's a disaster. The movie's oh, yeah. terrible. What was interesting as you're watching the movie, you know, um, and and when it came out, I was th- the first moment in the theater to see it because I was such a fan of the book and I realized that they just kept jamming stuff into the film that they liked from the book Yeah, <laughs> that you know that maybe told the story maybe didn't and it so it just became this this mess it's just a it's just a dreadful it's an interesting experience to what what when, when it doesn't work and, yeah. and 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 not being judicious about what you use and what you don't use. Yeah, I mean, Eric Heiser, when he talks about adapting this story, he said the thing that caught his attention was just how wrecked he felt emotionally by the end of reading it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was the thing he wanted to preserve, but then he had to add conflict because in the story, as far as I'm I'm told, um, you know, the aliens are at a, at a distance and people are sort of able to live with that. And so if he brings them to earth, that opens up the potential for conflict, right? That opens up now the military is involved and now there are riots. Now there's you know an, ex- an expectation for conflict between humans and the aliens. So I kind of get the sense that with, with a novel, you have to figure out what the spine of it is and yeah. affect a lot that's around the spine. But with a short story, because it is so contained and limited, you can luxuriate in it, but also this, it, all that all that exists is the spine. I, I, I almost wonder if movies are more akin to short stories than novels. Maybe, and, mm-hmm. and I know we've got to wrap up, but let me just throw this out there real quick. And Avi, he may have been in class, a young man named Daniel, I'm forgetting his last name. Uh, do we have two? Do we have a minute? Two minutes? One minute. Alexi, we have a minute. Yeah, okay. yeah. I have plenty of time. <laughs> well, anyway, here, so I had this young man in advance years, years ago, and he was a terrific, terrific guy and, and writer, and he couldn't come up with a story. And, and he kept changing the story, changing the story. And finally, I said, listen, you're running out of time. You got to get going. You got to develop, come up with a story. And he said, I can't decide. I said, okay, fine. We're done with this. I'm assigning you a story. So uh, Avi, a little bit like an adaptation. I said, here are the, here are the guts. Here's the spine of it. I said, this guy, uh, his, his, his flaw, his name is Frank, and he's, and he's, uh, uh, he's uh, addicted to gambling. And he lives in Reno. He lives in Reno, Nevada. And uh, the guy who owns a casino calls him in. Buddy calls him in and says, 
hey, you owe me $400,000. I want my $400,000. And, and Frank says, I don't have it. And Buddy says, I'm going to break your legs if you don't get me my $400,000. But Frank says, I don't have it. And he says, okay, you want to work it off? Here's the deal. Go to Las Vegas. There's a guy in Vegas. His name is Mark Shanker. Go get him. Bring him back. If you have him here in my office by 5.30 Friday, your debt is washed. If you don't, you're a dead man. And, and Frank says, where in Vegas is he? And, 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 and Buddy says, that's your problem. Get out of here. And this kid wrote a fantastic script, wrote a, an amazing script. That's all I gave him. I just gave him those short story beats. That was and my he, class. Was it your class? It was, yeah, Daniel, yeah. I yeah, Daniel. He, yeah. Yeah, and I do remember that. You told, you told us about this in my class like a year later. Did I? I still, <laughs> I love this story because I couldn't imagine, Alexi, you couldn't imagine where this kid went with the story, right? Mm -hmm. Do you remember? Yeah. The, yeah. I mean, where yeah. he went, I never in a thousand years, and he nailed it. He did a great job. Anyway, yeah. so, uh, but that's, that's an idea of adaptation. You've got these pieces. That's all you've got now. What do you do with it? And, and that's where it gets fun and create and very creative. You know, it's yeah. it's adaptation, not like conversion. You're not literally converting something. It's a completely different medium and it changes. Yes. It changes a lot. Did and you know yeah, sorry. Keep going. No, go ahead. That's it. That's it. Where, where, where do we go next week? Uh, the, uh, the writer. Oh, yeah. uh, what are we doing next week? What are we doing next week? I can hold on. Next week, we are doing um, Rushmore. Adam hey. Speck. Adam, yeah. I love this film. It's one. I've never I think, seen it. I think it's Wes Anderson's best movie as a writer. That's my opinion. But he has evolved as a director after. Um, I love this movie. I think it's great. It's got so many great quotable one-liners. Um, oh, it's so good. It's so good. Adam's yeah, been telling me great. to watch it forever, and ever since we put it on the coffee class schedule, I've been like, "Well, I can't right now." And it's, I feel a little bit. I feel a little bit uh, about the actor the way you do, Adam, about Jeremy Renner. The, what's the actor's name? Jason Schwartzman. Schwartzman. I can't stand that guy. Oh, but I don't like I, him either. But he's great yeah. in this movie. He's, he's great in, in whatever this reason. movie. And, and, and the fact that the movie works in spite of him, it tells yeah. you what a great movie it is. Bill Murray steals the show, though. Arch. Bill Murray is great in this movie. Um, yeah, I've, I've got a lot to say. And I think everybody should read this script because it's a great screenplay. Um, oh, did Owen Wilson it's... help write it? Was it Owen, Owen Wilson is the co-writer? Because yeah. is that right? Yeah. No, Owen Wilson oh, is not wow. in the movie. But no, he... I know. So I meant... Owen Wilson. Yeah. So the fun fact: Spotter Owen Wilson Rocker. was was yes. Owen Wilson was Wes Anderson's college roommate, and they started as a writing partnership, and they wrote Royal Tenenbaums, Rushmore, and Bottle Rocket together. And uh, Owen Wilson was also an actor in Bottle Rocket and Royal Tenenbaums, but he just wrote Rushmore with him. And there's a lot of Owen Wilson's autobiographical uh, life details that come out in the story. Um, Is that right? Yeah. And they actually shot it at Wes Anderson's high school. Fun really? fact. Yeah. So, Abby, what were you going to gonna say? <laughs> what were you going to say before we changed the subject? Avi was going to say something. Oh. Oh, wow. oh, yeah. Just on the top topic of, um, of adaptation versus transcription, like Alexi was saying, just that um, the movie Annihilation, uh, which I mentioned earlier, uh, is based on a novel, except the writer director decided that after reading the novel, he liked all the ways it made him feel, but he didn't want to be sort of beholden to it. So he wrote an adaptation from memory without consulting the book. He only read it once, and he didn't even read the uh, the sequel novels. So he so there were there was crucial information about the characters he just didn't know, and he didn't mind because he just sort of took it as a starting off point. He wanted to say the same thing that the novel says, but say it drastically different. Interesting. Wow. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And on that note, we earth. should end uh, today's coffee <laughs> class. Arrival was a great choice. Alexi, Adam, yes. great breakdown. Really good. Ami, yeah. good to see you. But I want to hear more about the sperm on the moon. Oh, absolutely Yeah, look it up. Not. That's for, we'll that's for later. Week. No, wait, wait. It's sperm <laughs> and eggs. It's sperm hey. and eggs. Okay, but whose oh, decision oh, was okay. it? That was my point. Was, it was oh, I didn't definitely look into a bad that this is a good oh, idea. Wow, it okay, feels anyway. like we're running, it feels like wait, we're running wait, wait, wait. It is a good idea. Alexi, it's a good idea. We need a we need a bank. We need a backup. What, what happens I said if this I gave that much. I said we needed a flash drive. Alexi, okay. Alexi, there'll there'll be egg on your face when you realize the person who made this. Oh my god.
egg on my <laughs> Yeah, I guess we'll have to look it up, won't we? If it's a woman, I guess we'll be so. very good. All right. Have a great weekend, yeah. everybody. Have a good weekend, everybody. That was fun.